I've located a target. Our prime objective? Negative. How long has he been active? Too long. He's going to move again soon. Copy that. Send me the info. I'm on it. Transferring now. Received. End of transmission. It had been a long night in the emergency department. Julie was tired and ready to go home. All she wanted to do was unwind with a glass of wine in front of the TV. She walked to her locker to fetch her belongings, her shoes squeaking on the freshly waxed floors. She made her way to the elevator that took her down to the parking garage. As the doors opened, she could tell it was deserted, as was usual at night. This might intimidate some women, but not Julie. She didn't scare easily, and besides, there had never been any problems here before, that she knew of at least. She always backed her SUV into the parking space so she could pull straight out, and as she approached, she noticed a van she didn't recognize parked next to her driver's side. It was probably nothing, but a police friend had advised her what to do in just such a scenario, so she went to her passenger side instead. The space on that side was empty, better safe than sorry. As Julie entered her car from the passenger side, she did not see the attacker move swiftly from behind her vehicle, placing himself between the door and directly behind her. He wrapped a strong arm around her neck and with his other hand forcefully placed a rag over her mouth, muffling her scream. As she inhaled, she smelled a familiar chemical and started to lose consciousness. Oh God, no, she thought. She'd been so focused on the van that she hadn't considered anything else. As the ether filled her lungs, the world started to go black, but she was aware that she was being dragged towards the van. Then she heard it, a loud crack. She was barely holding on to consciousness as she felt her attacker's grip suddenly and completely loosen from around her neck and mouth. And then she saw something strange, a skeleton's face. The face spoke to her in a kind, concerned tone. It said, you're safe now. Then she passed out. Target eliminated. The package, secure. The message, delivered. End of transmission. Detective Robert Botts was waking from a dead sleep to the sound of his alarm clock. His mind foggy, he rolled over to hit the snooze button when he realized it wasn't the alarm at all, but his phone ringing. Hey, Robot, we got a body over at the hospital. It was his partner, Stacy Lang. Robot was her nickname for him. He always hated it, which only seemed to encourage her all the more. Well, Stace, you know, that tends to happen at hospitals from time to time. Well, this one's not due to natural causes, and it's in the parking garage. I'm on my way over. Okay, I'm up. Detectives Botts and Lang arrived at the scene to find Portland police going through their protocols. They were greeted by a sergeant named Tim Masters. Botts and Lang identified themselves, and Botts being the lead detective asked, So what do we have here? Masters answered, I've never seen anything like this before. Our Vic here was apparently the assailant. Well, the intended victim is upstairs, a little shaken up, but otherwise fine. Her name is Julie Summers. She's a nurse here at the hospital. She was on her way to her SUV to drive home when she was attacked. So who used a knife to pin a note to this guy's chest? The nurse? No, she was unconscious when she was found. The perp dosed her with ether or something. This is where it gets weird. Apparently there was a third, uh, person or something involved. I'll let her explain that to you. As far as the note goes, it appears to be a verse from the Bible. Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27. So we've got some kind of a religious nut on our hands here? Well, that's what you guys get paid for. I'll leave that to you. Okay, thank you, Sergeant. Sure thing. Let me know if you need anything else. Okay, Lang, let's go see if we can talk to this nurse. In the elevator, Botts turned to Lang. Why don't you take the lead on this? Because I'm a woman, right? You're so sexist. Botts chuckled. She knew better. They found Julie's room and entered. She was sitting up speaking to her husband who was at her side. Mrs. Summers? Yes. I'm Detective Stacy Lang and this is my partner Robert Botts. Would it be alright if we asked you a few questions? Yes, of course. Can you describe what happened tonight to the best of your recollection? Julie recounted her experience as best as she could right up to the point where she passed out. Did you see the person who rescued you from the attack? Julie paused for a few moments. This is going to sound crazy, but all I saw was a skeleton's face and he told me I was safe. Julie's husband Michael chimed in. 
Skeleton or not, I would like to shake his bony hand. It doesn't sound crazy at all. You've been through a very traumatic experience tonight. Could he have been wearing a mask? Yeah, sure, that could be it. Everything was very fuzzy at that point. Of course. Well, thank you for your time. Here's my card. If you remember anything else, please don't hesitate to call. Oh, and glad to see you're okay. Thank you. The detectives decided to head home and try to get a few more hours sleep before going to the precinct. It would be a while before the forensic team and medical examiner had their findings anyway. You know, Stace, as far as the skeleton space goes, I think you're probably right. I've seen tactical masks exactly like that in catalogs that I get. You thinking what I'm thinking? From what we've got so far, I'd have to say we're dealing with a pro. You know, when this gets out, a lot of people are going to consider our mystery man a hero. It would be hard to argue otherwise. I know, I got a bad feeling in my gut about this one. Well, robot, you're probably just hungry. Up for a little overtime tonight? Sure. Been busy, have we? This one requires a little B&E. Copy that. Send it over. On its way. Received. End of transmission. Bots arrived at the precinct that morning, coffee in hand. Lang was already there, as usual. Hey bots, caffeine is bad for you. No youngster, caffeine is bad for you. It's very good for me. Sleep well? Nah, fitful. You? Like a baby. Lang had an ability to shut it off, so to speak, when not on the job. He admired that about her. So we got anything yet, bots inquired? Everything's in. Talk to me. The hospital has security cameras throughout the parking garage, but according to the IT director, the camera covering that section was painted over, probably by the Vic. It would appear that the only evidence our skeleton face left behind was the knife and the note. And get this, according to the ME's report, the knife to the chest was not the cause of death. That was due to a massive blow to the spine at the base of the skull. Death would have been instantaneous, and he never saw it coming. You're right, bots. This guy is definitely a pro. We only found what he wanted us to. Other than that, he's a ghost. And how the hell did he know when and where to be in the first place? I mean, if we could do that, crime in Portland would be virtually eliminated. Almost sounds like you admire him. Honestly, yeah, a little bit, and he did save a woman from God knows what. That reminds me, I looked up that scripture last night. Hence the lack of sleep. What does it say? I printed it out. He pulled a sheet of paper from his pocket and unfolded it. Okay, Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor, and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her they let that settle. Well, that would seem to explain motive. Our Vic had priors for sexual assault. So it seems we are dealing with a very capable, religiously motivated individual, and I doubt we've seen the last of him. I think he's just getting started. That very moment, as if on cue, Bots' phone beeped, alerting him that there was a new text. He pulled his phone from his pocket, read for a few moments, and almost under his breath exclaimed, Oh shit. What is it? asked Lang. Missy Baxter. Bots looked stunned. Who? asked Lang. It was a case I worked on a few years back. A little girl abducted from her room. We never found her. And? Lang pressed. Bots handed her his phone and she read the text out loud. Detective Bots, go to the following address. Missy Baxter needs your help. I left the front door open for you. Number unknown. Bots, do you think this is the same guy? I don't know. Bots seemed speechless. That case had haunted him. So what's the call here, robot? Suddenly he seemed to snap out of it and gain focus. Grab a few units. We need to go check out that address. They arrived at the house, approaching the front door with guns drawn. The door was ajar. Portland police, Bots shouted as they entered and almost immediately took a step backwards. Holy shit! one of the officers exclaimed. There in the foyer, right in front of them, was a man slumped over in a chair, a piece of paper with the now familiar Bible passage, Deuteronomy 22, 25-27, firmly affixed to his chest with a knife. Bots looked at Lang. Well, to answer your question, definitely the same guy. 
Lang just nodded. While the other officers spread out to check the rest of the house, Botts stepped behind the victim to look at the back of his neck. Yep, check out the bruising. Exact same M.O. Botts, that's two in one night. Yeah, I know. They heard the officers shout clear as they checked each room. Botts and Lang headed towards the kitchen where they found the basement door wide open. They headed down the stairs. As they reached bottom and turned into the room, they saw a makeshift bedroom inside of a large jail cell-like cage and lying there on a cot was Missy Baxter. Botts hurried through the open door and kneeled beside her, checking her breathing and pulse. She's alive! Botts gently woke her up. She was very groggy. Missy, it's okay. We are the police. Missy responded, The nice man said you would be coming for me. The nice man? Did you see what he looked like? No, he was wearing a mask, like a skeleton. He said it was his Halloween mask. Did he say anything else? He told me I was safe now, that the mean man wouldn't hurt me anymore. He gave me something to make me sleep and said that when I woke up, the police would be here to take me home. He was very nice. Yeah, okay, sweetheart. Let's get you home. Hey, bots, let's take her out the back way. Yeah, right. Good idea. On the drive to the hospital to get Missy examined, bots made the call to her parents informing them their daughter had been found. After witnessing an emotional, tear-filled reunion and receiving thanks from the family, they headed back to their office. Feels pretty good, doesn't it, Bots? Yeah, it does. Try not to be so enthusiastic. Don't get me wrong, I'm very happy she was found. I just can't help but notice that we had very little to do with it. So what's your point? My point is, this little girl disappears from her own bedroom without a trace and has not heard from for years. I mean, I worked this case hard and came up with nothing. And then all of a sudden, this mystery skeleton man hands her and her captor to us on a silver platter. So I'm wondering, where the fuck is this guy getting his information? He rescues a woman and a girl all in a few short hours. On one hand, he seems to be helping us, and on the other, he is making us look pretty inept. Bottom line, though, he is a vigilante, and we can't have someone running around the city taking matters into his own hands, acting as judge, jury, and executioner. He did murder two suspects. Lang chuckled. Something funny about that? Just the word suspects. He did catch them in the act. Right or wrong, he has to be stopped. Yeah, I know how it works. So how do you suggest we go about stopping a ghost with capabilities that make us look like we are out of our depth? That, Lang, is a very good question. After a few minutes of pondering what to do next, the phone rang and Lang answered. Lang here. Yes, sir. That was the chief. He wants us in his office post-haste. Of course he does. They entered Chief Patterson's office. Please have a seat. So I hear you two have been quite busy. First off, how is the Baxter girl? Bot started. Well, considering what she's been through, she'll probably need years of therapy, but she seems resilient. And you, Robert? What do you mean? I know how close you were to this case. I would think this would bring some much-needed closure. Yes, sir. At any rate, fill me in on the details of both cases. Over the next several minutes, Botts and Lang took turns relating the events of the day. Lang finished with, So I think that pretty much brings you up to speed. The chief sat silent for several moments, looking pensive. Okay, so here's the deal. Apparently the press has gotten wind of all this. An impressive detail, I might add. We have a leak? Lang queried. Can't be sure. It's a definite possibility. But right now, we need to focus on damage control. I'm calling a press conference this afternoon to try and get ahead of this. That should do it for now, but keep me apprised of anything new. Sure thing, Chief. Later that afternoon, in front of police headquarters, reporters from the local news stations gathered. Chief Patterson stepped to the podium. Many of you probably remember the case of Missy Baxter, the girl who was abducted from her room a few years ago. After an anonymous tip, she was found earlier today. She is in good health and has been reunited with her family. All the reporters immediately started hurling questions at the Chief. He pointed to a reporter from Channel 12 News. Chief, isn't it true that there was an unknown person involved that actually found the Baxter girl as well as saved a nurse from being abducted from the hospital last night? We don't know if it was the same suspect involved in both cases. The investigations are ongoing. Suspect? Yes, there was also a murder victim in each case, and if anyone has any information that can assist us, we ask that they would please come forward. Yes, but weren't the victims actually the perpetrators of the crimes against Missy Baxter and Nurse Summers? Presumably, but look, 
It is the job of the police to stop crime. The chief continued to speak. Meanwhile, in the Channel 12 news control room, the tech director was monitoring the live broadcast when suddenly a news ticker started moving across the bottom of the screen. It read, With all due respect to Chief Patterson, the police do not stop crime. They respond to it. We are just filling in the gaps. If you are someone who preys on women or children, we are coming for you and we will find you. You have been warned. The message kept running in a continuous loop. What the hell? Is this us? Hey Jerry, you seeing this? Way ahead of you, Doug. It's not us. Can't tell where it's coming from. Doug placed calls to his contacts at the other news channels. It's not just us. Everyone's got it, but no one knows its origin. You ever seen anything like this? Nope, never. After the news conference, the chief, Botts, and Lang gathered in the chief's office and were apprised by the chief's assistant as to what just transpired. Thank you, Amber. That'll be all for now. Amber left the room. All right, detectives, would you please tell me what the hell is going on here? Botts responded. I'm sorry, sir. I wish we knew. This has all been happening so rapidly. It seems we are dealing with someone that has skills that are off the charts, and every step of the way he demonstrates it at a higher level. I think this is pretty unprecedented. Lang, you have anything to offer? I'd like to point out that the news ticker message used the word we three times. We have to consider the possibility that we are dealing with more than one person here. Well, fucking fantastic. You two need to jump on this and get some results. It wasn't just me that was made to look like an idiot out there today. The whole department was made a laughing stock. Dismissed. On their way back to their office, Lang commented, Man, the chief was pissed. Botts responded, You blame him? Got any dinner plans? No, but I'm starving. You bring the beer, I got the pizza. Sounds good, on my way. I've got something big. See you in about 90. End of transmission. Jacob Wallace headed out to the coast. Highway 6 wound its way through the mountains in the Tillamook Forest. It was a beautiful drive. He stopped at a convenience store and picked up a 12-pack. Bay City was a quiet little town overlooking the Tillamook Bay. Jacob pulled into the driveway and parked. His brother Joseph opened the door before he reached the front porch. Jake! Hey Joe, good to see you. Come on in. Jake headed to the fridge to put the beer away and grab two bottles to start. His mouth started watering as he smelled the pizza baking. It's almost ready. I put it in the oven when you're still about ten minutes out. Jake chuckled. Not even I can sneak up on you. That's why I'm the best. Yeah, at the technical shit anyway. Okay, Master Wetwork, give me that beer already. As Jake handed Joe his beer, they embraced. They had always been very close, even more so lately. Nice job preempting that press conference. That was a thing of beauty. Joe took a mock bow. Yeah, at this point, they probably had their skivvies all in a bunch down at police headquarters. They continued talking as Joe pulled the pizza out of the oven, cut it, and put two pieces on each plate. So tell me about this big news. They both sat down at the table. Our prime objective, I've pinned down two targets. Jake got an intense look in his eyes. It appeared as if he would jump out of his chair. Thing is, they are connected to something much, much bigger. Like what? Oh, like human trafficking? There is a sex slavery ring operating right out of Portland. You know the prime objective is what we've been working towards. Yes, but we also decided we would not look the other way either, that we would act to stop this kind of sick shit wherever we encountered it. Look, we'll accomplish our prime objective, that's a given, but we could also deal a massive blow here. Okay, where do we start? Well, we start by finishing our dinner, then I'll show you what I've worked up so far. They ate, drank, and talked about good times. After they finished and relaxed for a bit, the conversation turned to business. Joe began. So what we have here is high level, international, and involves port officials, politicians, dirty cops, and a host of others. The women and girls are abducted in Portland and surrounding areas, and transported on container ships to various countries overseas where they are sold. We are going to blow the lid off of a very big can of worms. We'll need to work fast. There's a ship scheduled to leave in two days. We should hit it tomorrow night. They'll have everything loaded and ready to go with the guards and crew on board. They are all involved and should be considered hostiles. Give no quarter. I figured you'd want to get wet. I've reconned the perfect staging area on the Columbia just upstream. As usual, I'll be guiding you on comms. You'll know exactly where everyone is at all times. 
and our prime objective? That comes after. They will not be present. They are in acquisitions, so to speak, and operate within the city. I'm working on something to draw them out, but due to the imminence of our maritime situation, we have to act on it first. And besides, our prime objective is far too important to rush. Don't worry, I've got something special planned. You know, Joe, it never ceases to amaze me how much darkness can dwell in the human heart. I consider it our purpose to shine some light. I should get some rest. Big day tomorrow. They both stood and embraced. Love you, brother. Love you, too. Jake headed for the door. Don't forget your intel packet. Jake grabbed the manila envelope off of the table in the foyer on his way out to his car and the dark drive back to the city. Jake arrived at the staging area, suited up, entered the water, and swam silently downstream until he reached the container ship. Using suction cups, he scaled the side of the great vessel. Utilizing secret military satellite technology, Joe could see everything. All clear, head to your right. Jake landed on deck with cat feet and started to move throughout the ship, dispatching targets with ruthless efficiency. He only used his firearm when he couldn't close the distance. Even though it had a silencer, he preferred to use his knife. It was just quieter that way. The military had used his skills for their purposes, but now he used them for a higher purpose. He was an instrument of righteous justice, a hammer of God. All targets neutralized. Nice work. Now leave our calling card and get out of there. Bots, we've got a situation down at the shipyard. The detectives arrived at the container ship. As they boarded, they were met by Sergeant Masters. We've got bodies all over this thing. Looks like the work of a hit team. Wang's eyes were drawn down where there were arrows spray-painted on the deck, leading back among the containers. What's this? That's how I knew I had to call you guys. Check this out. They followed the arrows until they led to a specific container, and there spray-painted across the front was Deuteronomy 22, 25-27. Can we get some bolt cutters over here? Bots asked. They snapped off the lock, opened the doors, and as the morning sunlight washed in, they saw its contents, a large group of terrified women. Oh my God, Lang thought, too stunned to speak. Seeming like he was completely beyond surprise, Botts spoke. Portland Police, it's okay, you're safe now. Botts and Lang arrived back at the office where Botts found a large envelope with no return address on his desk. He opened it. On the front was a cover page that simply said, You're welcome. As he examined its contents, he said, Lang, you're not going to believe this. Sending target locations. Received. End of transmission. Charles Rennes slowly regained consciousness. As his eyes and mind started to clear, he realized he was unable to move. What the fuck? He was duct taped to a chair. He heard something to his right, looked over and saw his partner Brad Laramie in the same predicament. They were in a well-lit, empty room with carpet on the floor and acoustical foam covering the walls and ceiling. Brad, what the hell happened? I don't know, man. Where the fuck are we? The last thing I remember is... Just then, the door in front of them opened, and Jake and Joe entered, wearing black clothing and skull masks. Oh shit, Rennes thought. Jake spoke calmly. I know you have questions. Don't worry, we will make it abundantly clear as to why you are going to die here tonight. Laramie felt like his stomach was crawling up into his throat. You see, you've been here before. You can't tell from this room, of course, but make no mistake, you've been here before. You see, we used to have a mother and sister who we love very much and you took them from us. While my brother and I were overseas, you showed up one night, broke in, and brutally raped and murdered those beautiful women. Because of that, you have been living on borrowed time, and now we are here to collect. Jake and Joe could see realization in their eyes. Then Joe uttered the last words. We're sorry to inform you that because this is deeply personal, we are not going to make this quick. Then they went to work. So you mean to tell me the carnage on that ship was due to this one man? That's correct, Chief, Botts answered. And then he just delivered all this evidence. Lang replied, Yes, sir, but we believe he has at least one accomplice who handles the intelligence side of things. He's probably the one who put this all together. You realize there are some powerful names here. Yes, sir, we do, but we vetted all of it. It checks out. Okay, get with the prosecutor and let's see where this goes. On the way back to their office, Botts heard his phone and retrieved it from his pocket. He inhaled deeply and exhaled. Something wrong? Lang asked. 
Just an address. I think it's our guy again. Come on, let's go take a look. As they drove through the neighborhood, everything seemed eerily familiar. They found the address and parked on the street. The front door was ajar. They announced themselves and entered. The house appeared empty, but they could hear rock music coming from the back. They announced themselves again loudly, but with no answer. So they made their way towards the sound, guns drawn. Bots recognized the song, Knocking on Heaven's Door, the Guns N' Roses version. They approached the room the music was emanating from. The door was wide open. They announced themselves again and entered. There before them were two men duct taped to chairs, heads slumped over. The only other thing in the room was the stereo playing the one song on a continuous loop. This is different. These men were tortured before they were killed, and there's no message. It doesn't fit the M.O., Lang commented. That's because this was revenge. How do you know that? Because I've been here before. Sarah Wallace and her daughter Rebecca were raped and murdered here. This was their house. I worked the case, but we never found the perps. You said revenge, so who did this? The father? No, the father had passed away years before, but they also had two sons, Jacob and Joseph, who were in the military on assignment overseas at the time. That's who did this. So now we have two suspects. We finally have something to go on, bots. Sure, we'll have to flesh it out as a matter of protocol, but think about it. We had nothing up to this point. Do you really think they would have done this if there was even a chance they could be caught? No, they're just too good, and I don't think they want to be caught. Mark my words, we will never find them. Well, bots, you were right. Everything indicates that the Wallace boys are deceased, killed in action. They even have marked graves at the Veterans Cemetery. I checked the records for the house. It's paid off and the taxes are paid yearly by a trust that was set up. It's a complete dead end. Botts and Lang watched as the story broke on the news about the sex trafficking ring and the arrests that were made. You know, Robot, I think some of these people are going to get away with it, with all their power, money, and connections. What about you? I think they may never see the inside of a jail cell, but I have a funny feeling that they're not going to get away with anything. Target located. Thank you.